U.S. infrastructure is targeted by attackers. Rambleed can still crypto keys and Yubi keys get recalled. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. <laughs> Greetings, I am Shannon Morrison. This is ThreatWire for June 18, 2019. Your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. It is time for a quick shout out. This one goes out to Vot, Zach, Kevin, Corgitronics.com, Emmanuel, Cypher, Seth, Spider, Fred, Keith, Dennis, and Cove Technology who joined the Patreon team this week. Also, I am introducing a new Patreon perk this week. So for Turbo Panda patrons and up, you will receive a weekly newsletter detailing important security and privacy news from the past week. Since I only have time to cover three topics each week, this is my way of bringing you news in an easily read format so that you can see exactly what I'm researching to find news stories to share with you. So if you are interested in supporting ThreatWire on Patreon, hit up patreon.com slash ThreatWire. And now on to the news. Hacking group Xenotime has expanded its threat activity to target ICS, or industrial control systems, in the United States, including the electric sector, gas, and oil utilities, as published by Dragos Inc., a cybersecurity company, on Friday. According to Dragos, Xenotime is the same hacking group behind the Trisis ICS hacks, which were discovered by Dragos back in November of 2017. Now, while the Trisis malware affected Middle Eastern companies, most notably a Saudi petrochemical plant two years ago, causing it to shut down while being remediated, this new activity shows that the group is not slowing down in their ICS attacks, and if anything, they are gaining traction. So who is behind these attacks? Dragos has not blamed any one country for being the culprits, but FireEye reports that some data links Xenotime to a Moscow research institute in Russia. ICS attacks have been popular in recent years, as hacking groups receive state-sponsored funding to expand their targeting. These groups are starting to see profits from the attacks, which in turn has made interested parties give them more resources so they can expand their attacks and capabilities, making ICS protection more and more important. Dragos was tracking Xenotime and saw their behavior change in February when they began probing U.S. companies. Xenotime uses external scanning, network enumeration, and research of potential victims to try and gain access to victim networks. This kind of operation falls under the reconnaissance category, which is the first stage in any cyber attack. Xenotime also attempted credential stuffing, and they tried to gain access with stolen username and password combos. Xenotime seems to be expanding to more vertical not just oil and gas, to potentially gain a foothold on U.S. soil. Drago shared with Wired that at least 20 U.S. electric system targets have been probed by Xenotime, and that includes power generation plants, transmission stations, and distribution stations. Now, while there is no evidence showing that they have actually been able to breach any U.S. electric companies, they are actively gathering information on those utilities, and as such, their activity should probably be taken seriously. Since their first attack on the Saudi ICS was done to cause physical damage or even loss of life, this should be cause for concern, and ICS organizations should probably take heed of Dragos's advice. Dragos recommends industrial companies use threat detection techniques and implement defenses in the event that they are targeted. Shout out to Cypher Dragon on Patreon for sending in this story. Rowhammer was a 2015 flaw that could use repeatedly accessing rows of cells of memory in DRAM to introduce bit flips, which means that the cell would flip from one state to another, from ones to zeros or zeros to ones. The bit flips would happen in adjacent rows too, not just the ones being attacked. This could allow an attacker to do privilege escalation attacks and device takeovers. Now, since this time, Rohammer has been used as the basis for a series of attacks, most recently being ones discovered by University of Michigan, University of Adelaide, and Graz University of Technology researchers in a combined effort. This new attack, which is dubbed RAM Bleed, allows an attacker to read the memory data without ever accessing the memory itself. It's a side channel attack, which will allow an attacker to read out physical memory that belongs to other processes. The researchers do not believe that 
that this has ever been used in the wild as of this time. Rambleed, which is CVE 2019-0174, reads the bits of data that bleed from the RAM when row hammer is causing bit flits in the memory by determining the values in nearby DRAM rows in the physical memory of the victim computer. Bit flips in one channel cause the data in side channels to also flip, and if the data in those side channels belongs to different processes, the operating system will leak data from those RAM modules. While row hammer caused issues with integrity of a machine, RAM bleed causes problems with confidentiality. Since it is used to actually read side channel, it does not require the bit flips to be persistent. An attacker would just need to know a bit flip occurred at some point to then look for a leak of data. Now, while the actual implications vary because it all depends on what kind of software is running on a targeted machine, which determines which kind of data an attacker would actually gain access to, the researchers did include a proof of concept in which they were able to do an end-to-end -end attack to read the open SSH 2048-bit RSA key of a target. Now, this does not mean that open SSH keys are vulnerable. It means that a local attacker could use Rambleed to access almost any data stored in the memory of the computer, including SSH keys. The researchers explained that this can be used against ECC memory, which is popular amongst many manufacturers. It affects DDR3 and DDR4, though if you have TRR, which is targeted row refresh enabled, the process is a little bit tougher to accomplish, but it also affects mobile devices, laptops, servers, and desktops. The researchers' paper is linked and they recommend mitigating these techniques by upgrading to DDR4 with TRR enabled, since it is a little bit harder to hack than DDR3 or DDR4 without target row refresh enabled. They also recommend manufacturers test for this issue and publicly document TRR implementations. Since this requires local access though, the vulnerability is considered low severity. Before we hit story number three, I wanted to say thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. I am adding new perks as we speak, so definitely check out patreon.com slash threatwire if you want access to extras. Also, a huge thank you to our Hush Puppy perk level patrons for sending in their fur baby photos. I love them so much. Keep them coming. According to a security advisory published by Yubico, who are the makers of YubiKey security keys over the weekend, some FIPS series devices with versions 4.4.2 and 4.4.4 are experiencing a security vulnerability with their encryption values, which have reduced randomness, meaning that they are not as effective in generating uniquely random keys as they should be. The flaw holds predictable content in the buffer during power up, and it causes the cryptographic keys to be influenced, creating not-so-random keys. Once this buffer is used up, they go back to being just perfectly fine, but it's still a flaw nonetheless. The flaw only occurs upon power-up of the key, so it would impact the very first set of cryptographic operations done by the YubiKey FIPS device. It does not affect any non-FIPS device keys, though. Ones affected include YubiKey FIPS, Nano FIPS, C FIPS, and C Nano FIPS. The vulnerability affects keys in different ways, too. Some would allow an attacker to partially recover an encryption key, others would allow them to recover the full key, which in both cases is somewhat dangerous. YubiKey has included a technical release detailing the differences on their site. Now, FIPS stands for Federal Information Processing Standards, and they are the standards for encryption algorithms for use within non-military government agencies or contractors. Yubico uses this standard of compliance for some of their devices in order for them to be used on those agency networks. So yours might not be affected if you are a consumer. Yubico is offering replacements of vulnerable keys via a portal on their website Site, which is linked below. If you don't know if your device is a FIPS device, there's two ways you can tell. You can use the YubiKey Manager software to look it up, or you can check the label on the device because it should say FIPS, F-I-P-S, if there is one. Now, new devices come with updated firmware, which is version 4.4.5. This new firmware also has the new FIPS recertification, which was completed on April 30th. Yubico originally found the flaw back in March, and they underwent an investigation to find the cause and mitigations. Now, while no exploit has been seen in the wild, it should not be ignored. So get that replacement issued as soon as possible if yours is vulnerable. And with that, do not forget to like and subscribe. And thank you to everyone who has been subscribing to my personal channel, which is youtube.com slash
Morris. I appreciate seeing you there and shout out to everybody who has been commenting on my recent episodes. I'm Shannon Morris and I will see you on the internet. Thank <laughs> you.